One X player has entered the new year with a new handheld. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? Can this really be called a handheld? The One X player X1 is a three in one machine. And it's the first of these sort of devices that has an Intel chip on board, at least the first in a long time. These two things together make the One X player X1 very different from all the handhelds that I have personally reviewed so far. Starting with the Intel APU, the chip on board is the Intel Core Ultra 5 135H. This is the same APU that's going to be in the $699 MSI claw, and some people have had concerns about how it can compete with AMD's line of APUs that have become so ubiquitous in PC gaming handhelds. So that's the first burning question that I need to address in this video of the One X player X1. The base machine is a tablet and it comes with four attachments. The first is a magnetic kickstand that attaches to the back. The second is a magnetic keyboard flap that attaches to the bottom via pogo pins. This is similar to Microsoft's Surface Pro line of computers. The last two attachments are the left and right control pads, which function like Nintendo Joy-Cons, Lenovo Legion Go's True Strike controls, yes, that is what they're named, or the removable controls of the One X Player 2. I'll tell you more about that in a minute. Altogether, that means that the One X Player X1 can be used as a tablet, as a laptop, and as a handheld. So the next burning question for me is, how good is it in each of these use cases? Sadly though, I was not sent the control pads. That's why I'm showing you the One X Player 2 control pads. So what gives one netbook? Well, according to my representative, they weren't sent to me because quote, during tests, there has been a slight bit of looseness between the controllers and the X1, end quote. I addressed this a little bit more in my disclosure, but the point is I'm not going to be able to test the controls until they send me a pair. Yes, I saw that ETA Prime got his pads and yes, I'm jealous. Still though, I'll be able to test it as a tablet and as a laptop and give you my thoughts on how it should work as a handheld. Given all of that, let's go to my disclosure. One Netbook has sent me the One X Player X1 for free. No money has changed hands and they are not seeing this video beforehand. Importantly, they are calling this a prototype version of the device and they've labeled it as such as you can see on the device. So they sent me a prototype, they didn't send me control pads and the 135H chipset that I received is not actually the version that they're selling. More on that later too. The point is, there's no way I can call this video a review despite how much time I have spent putting this together. My representative did try to alleviate my concerns and they had this to say, quote, we understand you and your audience are concerned about reviewing early hardware and we want to assure you that according to our engineering team, the final production units equipped with the 125H and the 155H chipsets will closely represent the performance of the model you received 135H, end quote. I wanted to disclose their statement here so you're aware of the full context, but I do respectfully disagree with what they said. I think what I have received is not representative enough of the final product for me to call this video a review. So consider it an early impressions or a preview or a sneak peek. I've put in as much work as I would into a review, but I will not call it a review until I have something that is more representative of a final product. Finally, my reviews and impressions for that matter are always impartial and I aim to be thorough enough to help you form your own opinion, which for some people is absolutely going to differ from my opinion. So let's get started. If you're looking to pick one of these up, you can go through their Indiegogo page. The cheapest option is $859 and that comes with the 125H chipset. Then there are three options for the 155H chipset. Those are $999, $1,069 and $1,399, depending on your storage and RAM selection. Finally, they have those same four options, but paired with the 1X GPU in case you want to dock with a full GPU setup. All of these options come with removable controls, the back panel, and a screen film that's pre-installed. The keyboard is sold separately and so is the connector for the controller if you want to use the controller more like a traditional pad. Here are all the accessories you can purchase separately, including a stylus and oculink cable. One last note with One Netbook is that like many other boutique PC manufacturers, these machines are typically shipped directly out of a single country. This could pose a problem if you have to get your device serviced and are forced to ship to China and back to you. 
Because of the prototype nature, I wasn't sent full packaging, and so I can't tell you exactly what is in the box. I got the tablet, the back panel, and the keyboard in my shipment. I also received a standard 100 watt power brick and a four foot USB-C cable. The power brick doesn't have collapsible prongs, just so you know. As for the device itself, the tablet weighs in at 798 grams. As a laptop, this comes to 1217 grams with the back panel and the keyboard. One netbook says that the controllers weigh approximately 125 grams. So as a handheld, this would come in at 923 grams, which is about 50% heavier than the ROG Ally. Of course, this comes with the benefit of an 11 inch screen and a 65 watt hour battery, both of which are considerably bigger than what you get in the Ally or similar handheld. On the bottom of the tablet are connectors for the keyboard. On the left side are the two USB 4 ports and a plastic strip that covers the connection for the left half of the control pad. On the right side is a micro SD card slot, a USB A 3.2 port, and a plastic strip that covers the right control connection. Finally, on top, going from left to right, is a power button, a volume rocker, and a strip that can be moved to access the headphone jack and the Oculink port. All the way on the right, there's a turbo button. Traditionally on one netbook devices, these would be used to kick the APU into turbo mode, but by default on this device, it brings up one netbook software called One X Console. From within the software, you can control the TDP. Finally on the front, you do have a webcam and what appears to be dual microphones. Between USB 4 and Oculink, you have all the options you could ask for when it comes to connecting an eGPU. Finally, inside the tablet itself, you have LPDDR5X RAM, Wi-Fi 6E, Bluetooth 5.2, and a 65 watt hour battery. Here are some specs for good measure. The screen itself is pretty impressive, if for nothing else because of how big it is. It comes in at 10.95 inches, and that's larger, obviously, than the 7 inch that's become standard. It's even 25% bigger than the 8.8 .8 inch screen on the Lenovo Legion Go. Some people will point out that a big screen may not be the most ideal for handheld gaming and that the 7 inch target is a lot more suitable. I think that is a fair assessment, but it's clear that one netbook also wants this to function as a reasonable laptop. And I would say that the big screen is a benefit if you're going to use the device in that way. More important in size, however, this is an LTPS display with a 1600p resolution, 120 hertz refresh rate, and a 540 nit peak brightness. Here are some side by side so you get a better idea of the picture quality for this display. Since I wasn't sent the controls, I can't speak to that in this video. The keyboard that came with my unit, however, is well built. It has the WASDA keys highlighted, though that feels superfluous in my opinion. Everything about this keyboard, including the keys themselves, is incredibly reminiscent of the Microsoft Surface Pro keyboard flap. It's very usable for productivity. My only gripe with the Surface Pro form factor, even going back to my days with the Surface Pro, is that it's not as comfortable to use on your lap as a laptop. But in this case, as a gaming device first and a productivity device second, I think that's actually a really good fit. The speakers on the X1 are on the sides of the tablet. They're powered by Harman and they sound really good competing with the Steam Deck and the ROG Ally for quality. Because these speakers are side firing, you may be tempted to wonder if having the controls plugged in would obstruct the audio at all. But from my creative testing, I found that it didn't really alter or hinder the experience in the least. Unsurprisingly, there may be many of you who are just tuning into this video to see what kind of performance we can get out of the Core Ultra 5 series on a handheld. So I think it's time to talk about the raw performance, the heat output, and the battery life on the One X Player X1. As mentioned before, the X1 comes with two possible chipsets, either the Core Ultra 5 125H or the Core Ultra 5 155H. However, the unit I was sent was actually the 135H. This matches the $699 MSI Claw and sits somewhere in between the two models you can get for the X1. With that context, there are a few things I wanted to test for this chipset. 
What kind of driver issues would I encounter compared to AMD chipsets? How does this chipset scale from the high end to the low end? How does performance at different TDP profiles compare to AMD chipsets at similar profiles? Starting with game compatibility, there was one game in my testing suite that did immediately have a problem with this APU. Batman Arkham Knight ran at one FPS and basically wasn't utilizing the GPU at all. The fix for this one was easy. I just needed to use DXVK, which is as simple as dropping some binaries in the game folder. Then there are games like Lords of the Fallen. The lighting is broken in Lords of the Fallen, but this happens to be a problem on AMD APUs as well. The bigger problem is that there may be other games where you don't immediately know what's wrong, like HDR is broken or the game doesn't work until you turn anti-aliasing off. These edge cases are going to require you to Google to see if anyone has already encountered your problem and hopefully they have a fix. I tested a bunch of stuff and this didn't plague me to be honest, but your mileage is definitely going to vary. Getting into performance, I was curious to see how the performance for the 135H scaled. There's definitely a sweet spot where you get diminishing returns from the Ally or the Lenovo Legion Go, and that wasn't exactly the case for the 135H. I tested the same game at 18 watts, 20, 22, 24, 26, and finally 28. The performance per watt was consistent across all of those, meaning that the chipset was scaling linearly, and you always got a consistent bump from raising the TDP. The problem is the bump was honestly never very good. To put it into perspective, the performance I got out of the maximum 28 watts was comparable to the performance I would get out of the ROG or a similar handheld with an 18 to 20 watt TDP. There was one game that performed better on the X1 and that was oddly Arkham Knight. Now this is probably because it was using DXVK, but I tried the same process on a 7840U handheld and the comparison was closer, but X1 still got the win. Considering this was the exception, I think that this just requires more testing. As for battery life, it's worth noting once again that the battery here has a 50% larger capacity than many other Windows handhelds, but again, it'll probably need that larger capacity. At a 6 watt TDP, I could play Dead Cells or Kill Bug, and it would draw a total of 15 watts of system power. So playing well-optimized lo-fi games meant I could play for over 4 hours. At 26 watts TDP, I was drawing 43 watts. This means that when you're really pushing this APU, you will get about one and a half hours of battery life. To charge the battery from 20% to 80% took a little less than one hour. Finally, as far as heat goes, I was a little worried going in because it was pretty easy to overheat the Surface Pro, and I remember it was the top left corner that would get especially hot. Thankfully, that problem didn't exist here. The One X Player X1 would warm up, but it never got hot to the touch or felt like it was overheating in any way. So even though this isn't a review, I wanna leave you with my final thoughts, including some things I like and some things I'm not so happy about. First of all, I wanna say that One Netbook has been increasingly ambitious, and I like to see an attempt like this, which I feel hasn't been done before. I used the Surface Pro as my regular laptop for a few years, and it was nice, but I could never play games the way I wanted to on that thing. So having something in that form factor dedicated to playing games is really nice, and I have to say, I really like the idea of the three-in-one format, but I have to hold my judgment until I can try the controls. Likewise, I don't have an eGPU, but I like the sheer amount of options here where you can use Oculink or Thunderbolt docking. The One X Player X1 is just an incredibly versatile machine. One thing I wasn't so fond of, however, is the software. One X console has already needed a lot of work for a long time, and although they are continuing to improve it, I feel like it's so far behind that it needs a ton of work to catch up. The Intel Arc software that comes on board kind of helps to close the gap a bit, but not enough. One Netbook really have to increase their efforts here if they're serious about their handhelds. Finally, there's the matter of this new Intel APU. This device and similar Intel handhelds appear to be around the same price as handhelds that use AMD 7840U, if not more expensive. So in that way, the 135H and the 125H will be competing with the 7840U in this scene. And when I compare it directly to the 7840U, it falls short. Even putting compatibility concerns to the side, you can get better results with less power using the 7840U. Even with the TDP pushed to the max 28 watt TDP, it's just matching what the 7840U can do at 20 watt TDP. I think Intel has made amazing strides in the last year, but unfortunately for them, they are still playing catch up. Where the One X Player X1 shines best is as a productivity machine that can literally transform into a handheld gaming machine. It's also something that Surface Pro users may really enjoy. 
That's going to do it for today. I hope you've enjoyed this video. Consider liking it and subscribing if you want to see more. Goodbye.